So welcome everybody. Um, this is the seventh uh, session of the Octoscope uh, tutorial series. Um, this time we're going to talk about antennas. Um, you know, what are they? Uh, what do they do? What are some of the details such as gain, uh, polarization, uh, near field, far field, etc. Uh, we're really glad that you, um, you guys uh, could join us uh, this morning or whatever the time is in your part of the world. Um, let me introduce the speakers. Um, so uh, uh, this is Jan Nelinkola. I'm I run marketing for Octoscope. I recently joined a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the main speaker will be uh, Lee Chinitz. He is uh, an old veteran of the industry, has worked in Wi-Fi, cellular, um, has worked in um, at FCC, um, has worked in, uh, participated in the work of various standards bodies, uh, Wi-Fi Alliance, IEEE, ITU. Um, has, Lee has 20 patents on his name and has a PhD in physics, uh, along other degrees. Um, uh, before we get into the, the tutorial itself, I just want to remind everybody that uh, uh, you're free to uh, uh, ask questions uh, during the discussion at any time. Just uh, use the tools to, to raise your hand and, and we'll take your questions. Um, so with that, Lee, uh, the stage is yours. Hey, thanks, Yana. I, uh, as an old veteran, um, I would just like to say I'm, I'm no longer speaking to Yana. That's uh, <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Um, so, as uh, as described, we're going to talk today about antennas, um, and and also as mentioned, this is our seventh uh, tutorial. Um, so, I guess we'll keep doing this as long as people keep showing up. So, uh, thank you very much for showing up. Um, again, this the topic today is pretty seems like a pretty basic one. Antenna is very similar to uh, other kind of more basic ones we've done, like uh, link budgeting and things like that. Um, you know, but you know why antennas, right? Uh, antennas are uh, a very key component if you're talking about an, uh, a test bed where you're focused on doing over the air testing, uh, as we are. So uh, antennas are a key element. It's important to understand. We had a lot of questions about them. We thought it would be worth going through some, um, some sort of key topics. Um, okay, so that being said, let's start by getting one thing out of the way. Um, this is for the uh, English speaking, I guess, members of the audience. Um, these are antennas. These are antennae. Uh, I can't tell you how often when I'm having a conversation, people will say something like, wait, is it antennas or antennae? How should I be saying that? Um, when we talk about uh, the kinds of antennas that we're using for communication, um, we call them antennas. Um, if you have antennae in your test bed, um, that's probably a bug. Pause for hysterical laughter for the bug joke. Okay. Um, all right. How do antennas work? So we're going to start with some pretty, you know, basic stuff here. Um, how do antennas work? Um, answer to that question um, is that. So thanks for attending. See you next time. That was the shortest in our tutorial series ever so far. Um, just kidding. Um, those are, in fact, Maxwell's equations that describe um, electromagnetics, and uh, they are, in fact, um, equations that could explain in great detail how antennas work and what the fields nearby them look like, but um, I don't actually know anybody who is an antenna expert who um, knows everything that they know about antennas just from understanding Maxwell's equations. So let's, um, let's dig in a little bit, right? So seriously, um, what do we know? We do know uh, a couple things from basic physics. So it's good to start with a little bit of basic physics. Uh, and we know from basic physics that if you have uh, a, an electric field that's changing, um, that creates a magnetic field. If you have a changing magnetic field, that creates an electric field. Um, if you take a wire and you run current through the wire, you'll get a magnetic field uh, around that wire. It'll be static, um, but you know that's what an electromagnet's all about. If you start 
um, changing that current, so use uh, alternating current, for example, so that the current goes up and down and up and down the wire, um, you'll get a changing magnetic field. That magnetic field will s flip back and forth. Uh, and that results then in a changing electric field, which results in a changing magnetic field, and so on and so on. So if you look at this picture, this gives you a, a kind of a, a simple um, but, but useful, I think, understanding of, uh, of how um, a, an alternating current in a wire generates these uh, fields near the wire. So we have this, um, these um, blue circles that represent the magnetic field. You can see they're sort of horizontal in this picture. And these red circles uh, that re represent the electric fields, and they are vertical in this picture. Uh, and they, they radiate away from the, uh, from the wire itself. And that's why uh, when people talk about light, and I put light in quotes here, um, and you'll often see a picture like this. You'll see that you know, the light is, uh, is moving and there are two pieces to it. There's an electric field uh, and then there's a magnetic field and they're at right angles to each other. Um, I put light in quotes because I'm pretty sure uh, that everybody uh, here knows that um, electromagnetic waves are all um, pretty much the same. The only difference between light and anything else is that it's at a uh, different uh, frequency and one that um, our eyes are sensitive to, but it's the same story for uh, light waves or radio waves that we use for communication. The only difference really being the, um, the wavelength shown here um, as lambda, that's usually the way people talk about wavelengths. So the, the, uh, the distance between the, the peaks of these, um, uh, of these fields. All right, so now, that being said, we have our basic physics out of the way. So what's an antenna? So an antenna, basically a piece of wire uh, that's connected to a source of uh, alternating current. Uh, and as described, we can then drive the current up and down this wire, and that will cause electromagnetic waves to radiate. Um, it actually works in reverse, too. Almost everything that we'll talk about today works in reverse. Um, so if you actually hit a wire, uh, with an electromagnetic uh, field, with electromagnetic waves, that will actually cause the alternating current uh, to go uh, up and down. And that's what it looks like when an antenna is used as a receiver. So an antenna can both be a transmitter, um, where you cause the waves to come out, and it can be a receiver, where when, um, it, it, when it receives those waves, it uh, creates a current. Um, so uh, oh, this is too bad. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, um, so the energy then that comes out of antenna looks something like this. Um, so on the, in the picture on the right, we've got our little wire and you can see that um, we've got current being driven up and down, up and down. It's flipping back and forth, um, positive to negative, negative to positive. Um, and the frequency uh, at which that uh, flipping back and forth is happening um, is in fact the you know, the frequency of the, uh, of the, of the waves themselves. <clears throat> because light travels at the speed of light, hence the name, <clears throat> there's a relationship then between that frequency and the wavelength, which is shown here. The speed of light is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. Uh, and if the length of our antenna is um, about half of the wavelength, then we would get the energy shown uh, in this picture. So the energy that's coming out of that antenna um, shown in this picture is basically what would be happening in a slice. Uh, if you think of this slide as being a slice uh, in space, that's what, the, uh, that's what the, the, uh, the field looks like as it comes out of that antenna. Um, in three dimensions, it looks something like this. Um, and you can see the, uh, those, those slices, for example, are these uh, um, red circles or green circles, you know, you can slice either way. Um, it's symmetric all the way around. Um, it looks like uh, a donut uh, and it's referred to as a toroid. And that's what the, uh, the energy, the field coming out of, a, uh, of what's known as a half-wave dipole looks like. So now I've said half-wave dipole a couple times. I said that if the 
uh, if the, um, the length of our antenna is half of the wavelength, it would have that sort of pattern. So why do I keep focusing on half of a wavelength? Another uh, really useful way of thinking about antennas is to think of them um, as similar to strings. Um, and the reason is that you know, people are much more familiar with strings than they are with, uh, with uh, electromagnetics. Um, a lot of people played with strings and you can see this guy here playing with this nice long string and he's got um, one end of it attached on the right hand side the other end of it, he's holding in his hand, and he has uh, basically kept that fixed. And he is now vibrating that up and down, and he's looking for the, um, for the resonant frequencies, the frequencies at which he can make that string vibrate. And, uh, you know, this is something that, you know, a lot of people have done just playing around. And um, what you know, if you've tried to do this, is that um, you can only set up those waves, those um, resonant frequencies um, in for specific frequencies. So they, or specific wavelengths. Um, essentially what you need is for the string to be able to remain fixed uh, at the points at which it's fixed. So um, the very longest wavelength you can get is one where um, you've got a fixed point here and a fixed point here. Uh, and so the, uh, the string is, uh, again, then becomes half of the, the wavelength of the frequency. Um, and you can do that for any multiple of half wavelengths. Um, you can do two half wavelengths, three. This guy's got three going here. You can kind of see three. He's got uh, fixed over here, fixed over here. And then he's got um, one, one peak, another peak showing up down here, and a third peak over here. Um, and then four, et cetera, et cetera. You can keep going. Um, so again, the frequencies that you'll get are multiples of half a wavelength. And it's pretty much the same with antennas. Um, you, the half wavelength, half, wing, half wave dipole that I talked about before, again, has this, this shape that I described, this toroid, this donut shape. Um, and it is basically, if you want to think about it, um, kind of fixed at the top, fixed at the bottom, and then it's got this um, uh, this peak out here towards the sides. Uh, and so it's got a node at each end and a wave between the two. You can, you can use uh, different uh, length uh, antennas if you want. For example, you could have uh, an antenna where um, it's a one and a half wave dipole. Um, and that uh, would again have that shape, kind of like that guy was getting in that uh, in that little video clip before, where we have um, essentially four nodes, the two at the fixed ends and then two in the middle. And if you look at what the uh, antenna pattern looks like in that case, it looks like uh, what's shown here. Um, and again, it's not surprising. You essentially have your, you know, your, your fixed at the top and the bottom. You don't have um, energy coming out directly up or directly down. You've got a, a big lobe here on the top, you've got a big lobe here on the bottom, and you have two nodes in the middle and a, and a, third, a third lobe um, directly in the middle. Um, so the pattern basically reflects this kind of shape. So for communications, basic communications, you know, half-wave dipoles tend to be the rule. Um, you know, if you think about it, and let's think about kind of a specific application we're talking about, like uh, an AP, uh, a Wi-Fi AP in a home, which is trying to provide coverage, you know, pretty much everywhere in the home, you tend to want the energy to go in all of the directions. Um, same is true for a, a cell phone, for example, where, um, you know, the person holding a cell phone uh, doesn't know where the base station is that they're talking to, uh, and therefore, um, the, the, uh, the right way to design that is so that the, uh, the energy uh, coming out of that cell phone is going in all directions so that it can uh, communicate with the base station anywhere or, you know, no matter how that person is oriented. Um, and that's called omnidirectional. So the direction, the, uh, the energy is coming out in all directions. Um, we typically don't usually want the kind of nulls seen in that uh, one and a half wavelength dipole plot where we had those two big nulls in the middle. Um, that would mean there would be 
you know, very poor communication if the uh, if the 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 access point, for example, or base station happened to be in the direction of one of those nulls. Um, so um, you know, we, we know you don't want that, um, and that's why the half wavelength dipole is a really common uh, communications antenna. And the whole purpose of this discussion is to then point out that um, the size of antennas then are directly proportional to the frequency at which they're operating. You know, as I said before, the frequency is related to the wavelength. Um, we've just talked about why uh, it's kind of important to use antennas like half-wave dipoles, meaning that um, whatever frequency you're operating at is directly related to the size uh, of the antennas. So, for example, if you, um, you know, if anyone's ever seen pictures like this, like from the 1940s um, of various communication devices, um, like, you know, military radios here on the right, um, you always see these, uh, these guys walking around with radios and these just crazy long antennas. Um, you know, the reason for that is that uh, back in the day, um, people were operating at about 50 megahertz. Um, the wavelength at 50 megahertz is six meters, about 20 feet. So half wavelength dipole would be 10 feet long. So, you know, you now have some idea why, um, you know, back then antennas were always shown as being these really, really long things. But as technology has gone to higher and higher frequencies, uh, antennas are getting smaller. Um, and that's you know obvious from all the discussion that we've had. But just to give you a sense, um, 50 megahertz. Uh, if you look at the wavelength at 50 megahertz, like I said, it's about six meters, roughly the size of a giraffe. As soon as you move to 800 megahertz, the uh, kind of the low band cellular uh, frequencies around the world, 800, 900. Um, there you're talking about 37-ish centimeters, um, about the size of a bowling pin. Um, these two pictures are roughly uh, to scale, so you you know you can see the dramatic difference as you as you move up in frequency, um, and then the rest of these pictures are not to scale because you wouldn't be able to see them if I did them to scale. Um, once we move to the 2.4 gigahertz band, we're talking about about 12 centimeters, so a few golf tees. Uh, five gigahertz, the upper uh, up until recently, actually the upper. Uh, Wi-Fi band. Um, Wi-Fi is now moving to six gigahertz, but um, up until recently, the, the highest Wi-Fi band, five gigahertz, uh, just a, a set of aspirin. Uh, and then uh, if you look at uh, millimeter wave bands, um, then, you know, we're talking, you know, very small sizes, something like if we're talking about 25 gigahertz, we're talking about maybe a centimeter or so, um, which, by the way, is the reason that in the uh, millimeter wave bands, um, it's possible to start building antenna arrays uh, even into small devices because the antennas themselves um, are so small. I think I saw a question. Is there a question we need to take? Yeah, there is um, from Harold. It says that a quarter wave antenna are also commonly used. Yeah. What are their characteristics? If an antenna is not exactly halfway, say it's 40%, does the efficiency drop? For example, the power gets reflected back down the wire instead of radiated? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Um, I'm going to actually talk a little bit about that in just a second. Um, but yeah, you're right. Um, quarter wave antennas are used. Um, you know, there's trade-off between kind of optimal efficiency and size. Um, you know, you need to be able to put the antennas in the devices that you're building um, or on them. Um, and, you know, you can, you know, imagine how, uh, you know, that, that woman in that picture before, you know, with that huge long antenna, I mean, that may have been acceptable back in the 40s, but, you know, aesthetically, it's not acceptable anymore. Um, you know, when I remember seeing the early cell phones, you know, there were still those whip antennas that people had to had to pull out. Um, of course, we don't see that anymore. Um, you know, nobody would put up with that these days. And so, um, uh, you know, there's definitely a trade off there. Um, and you're essentially trading off uh, antenna efficiency um, for um, aesthetics. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, so antennas uh, then can, not every antenna is gonna work at every frequency. Um, you can try 
just like you can take a string and you can try to oscillate it at um, whatever frequency you want, um, but it's not going to work as well um, as at one of its resonant frequencies. So since the antennas are related to the frequency of operation, um, you know, you kind of need different antennas for different measurements. Um, just as said in the question, when an antenna is used at a frequency outside of its design range, um, then what happens is if you think about our little uh, picture before about the, uh, uh, the um, current being driven up and down the antenna and that resulting in energy radiating away from the antenna, um, what happens is that um, not all that energy does radiate away. In fact, exactly as asked, it bounces back into the transmitter. And so essentially the antenna becomes less efficient when that happens. Um, a, a measure of that is what's known as return loss. So when people talk about return loss, that's exactly what they're talking about. They're talking about uh, how much the energy bounces back. So a return loss of negative 10 dB means that 10% of the energy uh, that you're putting into the antenna bounces back in. Um, the other 90% gets radiated. That's pretty good. Um, there's no, there's no, uh, as far as I know, there's no uh, uh, single value that people require for return loss, but something like 10 dB or 15 dB is a, a reasonable, uh, you know, place to look at when you're talking about what a, uh, uh, where, where an antenna is operating optimally. So return loss plots tend to look like this. Um, on the vertical axis, we have return loss. Uh, and on the horizontal axis, we have frequency. Uh, and what you can see here is that uh, there is a point at which um, the return loss is very, very low, meaning all the energy is getting radiated. So this antenna is clearly designed to operate around you know, 2.45 gigahertz. Um, but it does operate you know, uh, at frequencies on either side of that. And you can ask yourself, so kind of where should I use it? And if you use 10 dB, negative 10 dB return loss, as the answer to that question, um, these markers show that that's between about uh, 2315 and 2580, so about a bit over 260 megahertz or so of bandwidth. So this antenna is designed to work at about 2450, um, plus or minus, you know, with, with, with a bandwidth, sorry, not plus or minus, with a bandwidth of about 260 megahertz. But, you know, not all antennas have, you know, a bandwidth that looks like that. Um, depending on your design, and you can put more uh, focus into your design, um, if, uh, if, if wide bandwidth is what you're looking for, you can actually get antennas that are quite wideband. Um, anybody who has um, had the opportunity to use an octoscope testbed will recognize the antenna that I'm showing here on the lower left. Um, this is uh, what we refer to as our high gain antenna. And if you look at the, uh, the picture on the right, you can see uh, the return loss plot, same picture as before, return loss is a function of frequency. Um, and if we draw a line at negative 10 dB, you can see that the return loss, um, uh, negative 10 dB return loss bandwidth for that antenna is over five gigahertz, um, not, not operating at five gigahertz, but five gigahertz of bandwidth from about uh, two gigahertz uh, up to over seven uh, gigahertz. Um, you can also see, by the way, something very important that, you know, there's when those, when antennas are designed that way uh, for, you know, specific ranges, um, the return loss can change quite quickly. Um, you'll notice that below two gigahertz, uh, the return loss rises quickly. Um, and so, um, you know, it is important to know what the um, operating range design of the antenna is. I see some questions, questions we should take. Um, uh, no, I think uh, it was just a comment. Okay, okay, yep. good, all right. All right, uh, so I mentioned that this is Octoscope's high gain antenna. Um, so let's get into that. Why did I bring up gain all of a sudden? Um, we mentioned it, let's talk about it. Uh, we actually mentioned gain in a previous uh, tutorial that we did where we talked about link budgets. And so it's worth getting into a little bit um, here. Um, without 
doing more math. I like to to use more um, you know kind of easy ways to understand what's going on. Sort of think about models for this. And this is a well known model. It's not one I made up, um, but it's I think a, a a very convenient way to think about gain. If you think about the dipole antenna that we talked about before, right, where we have that sort of donut shape uh, and we have um, basically no energy being sent up or down, um, but kind of all out in this big donut kind of shape. As that antenna gets smaller and smaller, that donut gets fatter and fatter. And if you go all the way down to sort of a point uh, antenna, um, you can imagine the energy being radiated out into just a big sphere. Um, in all directions. Um, it's not a real thing, but it is um, the sort of mathematically perfect antenna that people in the business like to use as the, as the default model. It's known as an isotropic antenna, and you can think of it as energy being radiated, radiating out um, in, a, in a perfect sphere, kind of like a balloon. So the energy would come out, it would look like this, this balloon. Now, if you design the antenna in such a way, you can, uh, what you can think about is that you can um, take the energy that's in that balloon, but you can squeeze it into different shapes. So the dipole is one example of that. Um, the, uh, the dipole, as we said, it doesn't have energy going up or down, but it had it going out in that um, kind of uh, donutty shape. But other designs are possible too. Um, for example, uh, directional antennas. In a directional antenna, you can imagine sort of squeezing the, the balloon so that all of the energy is going out in this example to the right of this picture. So if you were on the right-hand side of this slide, you would um, have quite good reception from this antenna. But if you're on the left-hand side of this slide, you would have quite poor reception because very little energy is going out in that, in that direction. Um, again, so think about the balloon as having a volume, which is the energy that it's putting out. And when we squeeze it, we don't change the overall volume. We just change where it's going. And, uh, and antenna designs um, you know, are all, really sort of all about that. Um, now, why would we want gain? Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. We do have a question. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, it, it, Natisha is asking, how do we optimize return loss for any antenna? Uh, well, I mean, return loss is a characteristic of the antenna, right? I mean, you, you can't optimize it. Um, what you can do is choose the right antenna for the, um, uh, for the, the test that you're doing. Um, so, for example, part of the reason we have such a wide... Um, bandwidth antenna in our test bed is that um, we want people to be able to do tests throughout the um, the uh, the frequency range that the that the test bed supports. So we typically say that you know our test bed is supports from <clears throat> about um, two gigahertz up through <clears throat> about seven and a half eight gigahertz. Um, and uh, if you looked at that return loss plot. For that antenna, you would see you would see uh, that, um, but you know we also have um, so so for example, if you wanted to use the test bed, um, but for example um, at a lower frequency, we do get requests from that from time to time. Let's say 900 megahertz, you can see that the antenna that I showed you know would have uh, quite a high return loss at 900 megahertz, but um, it's certainly possible to get 900 megahertz antennas and use them. So. That is um, what you do. So when, return loss is really an antenna characteristic, and you use that in order to, uh, to design your test. So, you know, why would we want gain, though, or directionality? I, I said something before, like, hey, half-wave dipoles rule, um, because, you know, you don't know where anything is, and you want to radiate in all directions. But that's not always true, right? Um, if you... Um, if you look at uh, an example like, like the one shown here, um, where I've got uh, buildings, let's say, uh, and one building is uh, sending a signal to another building back and forth, those buildings aren't moving, but I'm moving with respect to each other. Um, and therefore, 
um, radiating energy out in all directions doesn't actually make a lot of sense because I only want the energy to go to this building on the right and the, for the right I want the building the energy to go to the building on the left so I'm doing a lot better if I can actually squeeze the energy uh, into a narrow beam and point it where it needs to go um, the advantage there is that that contributes directly to the link budget um, for I'm not going to go into details on link budgets. We did that in a previous tutorial. So anybody who's interested, please take a look at that one. It's called Fundamentals of RF Link Budgeting in Wireless Test Beds. But uh, the, uh, the basic point is that um, the more energy you can point in the direction of the receiver, uh, the better that receiver is going to be able to hear you so you can go further. So if the transmitter and receiver are in a stable orientation relative to each other, and a high gain or directional antenna may be just what's called for. Um, so how does that relate to test beds then? Um, in a test bed, um, we will have uh, a device under test, like the one shown here. The, you know, in this, I know it's just an, it's just an image, but it's representative. Um, and you see this quite a bit. You'll have, for example, an access point or uh, you know, small base station, something like that. Um, and these, they will have um, dipole and like antennas, antennas with dipole characteristics. They'll be transmitting sort of omnidirectionally everywhere. Um, and there will be uh, test antennas that are interacting with this. Um, now, those test antennas tend to be placed near the edge of the RF chamber itself right next to the RF absorber, um, which is what's being used to create the anechoic environment in the test bed. Um, so if we put a dipole antenna as our test antenna, um, then we will have this pattern. Um, and again, if you can think of this right now from the point of view of this being a transmitter, um, as I said before, the whole thing is symmetric. It's true in terms of receiver, but um, maybe easier to think of as a transmitter for right now. So this thing uh, is transmitting energy. Energy is coming out in all directions. It's omnidirectional. And basically half of that energy is going directly into an RF absorber. Um, the whole point of the RF absorber is that it absorbs the energy. It doesn't go anywhere after that. It's not like it's getting reflected back out, um, right? The whole point is that it's not. Um, and so essentially the energy is being transmitted, going into an absorber and disappearing. So that's kind of a waste. Um, so there's actually a role for uh, directional antennas even in uh, wireless test beds. Um, because if you use uh, an antenna like the one I showed before where we were talking about the, um, uh, the return loss, um, and, and it has a, a shape something like this, you can see most of the energy is now heading in the direction of our device under test, uh, and very little of it is being uh, directed back towards the RF absorber. So in addition to wide bandwidth, I just kind of mentioned that in the previous slide, the antennas, uh, those high gain antennas, actually do have directionality, they have gain. Um, these are the actual uh, antenna patterns shown for these uh, for these uh, these antennas, and they're just being shown sort of in different slices of, of three dimensional space. But in basically all of the slices, they look pretty much the same. You can see the uh, the energy is being preferentially sent out uh, towards the tip of the of the antenna. And hey, I'm sorry, it looks oh, like yeah. we Oh, we have a follow-up. It looks like oh, sure. Nitish. Nitish is again asking, in, the in that case, what purpose of providing matching network at IP of antenna? So I think is it a follow-up to his previous? Yeah. Uh, in that case, what is the purpose? Well, uh, matching networks are very common. I mean, you always have one to the antenna. Or it's uh, part of the circuit design, I guess. So that they are the ones that optimize return loss. Did I answer the question? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I completely understand. But they're always there at the antenna. They match the antenna to a 50 ohm usually, 50 ohm connection. And the chip, whatever the chip is driving the antenna, it would be driving it through 50 ohms. Okay. 
hopefully that answers. Uh, otherwise, we can always, uh, you know, by the way, please feel free to um, reach out to us after if we're not uh, able to address whatever question you have during the tutorial, and we're always happy to keep, up, keep the conversation going. So there's one last topic related to antennas, um, and that's the issue of polarization. Um, if you remember that first picture that we showed with um, the alternating current and the radiating fields, um, and I mentioned that it works in reverse too, if you hit an antenna uh, or a wire with a field, um, you will you know, generate uh, a received signal. So um, that's you know, what I'm showing here. If you take an, uh, a wire oriented in the same direction as the, the transmitting wire, uh, when, when this electric field reaches it, it will drive a current, uh, and that's, that's our receiver. So polarization, when people talk about polarization, it actually refers to the orientation of this electric field, these red circles here. But if the transmit and receive antennas are not similarly oriented, as in this picture, like imagine putting one at right angles to this, um, then you can kind of just imagine just by looking at it that these electric fields are not going to be very efficient at being able to drive a current, meaning this uh, antenna um, will not necessarily be a very good uh, receiver for, uh, for this transmitter. So are those antennas that I mentioned before? Now we've talked about the return loss of those. We've talked a little bit about the um, uh, the gain of those. How about the polarization? Are they polarized? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, these antennas are what's known as uh, as log periodic antennas. Um, they're built from what are essentially a set of little dipoles. If you look at these uh, these these small uh, traces on this um, uh, on this design, you can think of each of those as a little dipole. We talked before about how um, uh, uh, shorter, uh, or sorry, lower frequencies have, uh, have longer wavelengths and therefore need uh, longer antennas. So you can kind of see how what we're looking at here are a set of antennas uh, designed to handle different frequencies from lower frequencies up to higher frequencies. Um, the log, by the way, and log periodic has to do with the, uh, the spacing between those um, uh, antennas, which are in, in a logarithmic uh, pattern. So the polarization then is basically the same as the polarization of dipole antennas, uh, just, just along the, uh, the, the dipoles shown here. <clears throat> Okay, so that now is kind of the basics of antennas, uh, things like gain and turn loss and polarization. Um, I want to touch on a topic that is very common, um, uh, which is this uh, topic was known as near field versus far field. Um, you know, we will often uh, talk with customers um, about uh, what, what people refer to as near field effects or things like that, whether or not a small chamber is able to, uh, uh, to perform um, you know, very well um, because of near field effects. So what is the near field, by the way? Let's, let's just define it for a second. Um, those, those equations that I showed you before, Maxwell's equations, they are correct everywhere and they can be solved everywhere in space, but they're a lot easier to understand when you're far away from the radiator. When you're far away, you get those patterns that I showed before, where you have electric field and magnetic fields that are at right angles to each other. Um, and you know what people like tend to like to draw uh, when they're talking about light or radio. Um, nearby the transmitter, the relationship between the electric and magnetic fields is a little more complicated. You have terms in those equations that, um, that are really only valid nearby. Uh, and then the electric fields, magnetic fields aren't necessarily only at right angles to each other. They have a much more complicated shape. Uh, and that's what people refer to as the near field. Um, where is that? Terms like near and far don't help that much. Um, but um, the near field actually depends on the frequency that you're operating at and the size of the antenna. I put antenna in quotes here. Um, uh, I'll explain to you why in a second. Um, 3GPP actually defines uh, the, the, the radius where the near field ends 
um, and this is their definition. It's related to, as I said, the, uh, the, the frequency or the wavelength. And then D here is what I have as antenna in quotes. It's actually uh, the, the, the biggest um, dimension of whatever is doing the radiating. So, um, for example, on a laptop, even though you might have an antenna built into the laptop, the entire antenna, sorry, the entire laptop case um, will participate in radiating. And therefore, uh, the, um, the equation here talks about the, the largest dimension, not just the antenna itself. So if the thing doing the radiating is, let's say, 25 centimeters, you know, not an unreasonable, you know, size, um, and the frequency is, let's say, 5 gigahertz, you know, obviously some like a Wi-Fi uh, kind of um, uh, frequency, the wavelength at 5 gigahertz is 6 centimeters long. So if you throw that into here, you see that the near field extends out about 200 centimeters, so 6 feet. Um, which means that for typical measurements done in an octabox, um, those measurements are in fact being done in the near field. I mean, people ask us about that, um, and it is true. Um, in many cases, um, measurements in the octabox are being done in the near field. So let's address what I like to call the elephant in the room here, which is can we do MIMO-based performance testing using antennas in a near field in a chamber in which we're in the near field? Short answer to that question is yes. And if that's not good enough, then I will have to go into some detail. If you're not gonna trust me, which I can sense through Zoom that you're not, um, then I will, I will give you a little more detail. Um, if you want a lot of detail and this picture doesn't scare you, then I would encourage you to take a look at the PhD thesis that is available on our website called Near Field MIMO Channel Modeling with Applications to Small Anechoic Chambers. Um, this was a PhD thesis uh, in which um, some very detailed measurements and a lot of uh, detailed analysis was done uh, specifically of the octoscope testbed and the uh, antennas that, I, that I've been describing. Um, but um, if you don't necessarily wanna dive into a full thesis, let me summarize some of the important points. Um, so one of, the, one of the key takeaways uh, from it, right, is what they mention is that, um, you know, large over-the-air test chambers, big anechoic chambers can be quite expensive, um, but research is showing that um, you can actually do MIMO OTA testing in a much smaller anechoic chamber with a set of probe antennas um, for significantly reduced cost um, and still be able to get um, quite good um, MIMO over-the-air performance. As I mentioned, the paper itself looked specifically at an octoscope testbed with octoscope log periodic antennas. And let me just give you um, a quick, quick uh, insight into what they took away. Um, what I'm showing here uh, on the right-hand side, this square, think of this square as being the, uh, the outside of the optoscope testbed. And, uh, and, and imagine we're looking down uh, from the top. Um, so this colored square, this little grid uh, in the middle here, is taking a look at the center of the testbed where the device under test would be. So you can see a circle here, it says device under test uh, central coordinates. So uh, this is the location of the DUT in the middle of the chamber. And based on uh, the many detailed measurements that were taken, as well as the uh, fairly complex um, uh, path loss modeling that was done, uh, they were able to determine what they call the wide band capacity of the test bed measured in bits per second per hertz. And if you look at this scale here, you can see that the MIMO capacity um, that they talk about is about 11 bits per second per hertz. So wait, before we uh, get too carried away with that number, um, it's important to know that those uh, measurements are done uh, at a fixed signal to noise ratio. The paper, just for the point, uh, you know, 
because they just needed to pick a uh, value, used 20 dB of signal to noise ratio. That's actually an extremely low value for signal to noise ratio. Let me explain quickly why. Uh, remember, we're in a shielded chamber. Uh, so in a shielded chamber, the noise level that we have to worry about is only the thermal noise in the receiver. If we take 160 megahertz bandwidth, then the thermal noise uh, at 160 megahertz is about negative 95 dBm. If we assume that the signal level that we can get uh, is something you know quite high, um, like let's say around the top level that is called for by the um, IEEE 802.11 spec of let's say negative 30 dBm, and by the way we can, you'll see that, we can reach those numbers. Um, that means that our signal noise ratio is more like 65 dB. Um, and the analysis then for 65 dB uh, shows that the capacity is more like 75 bits per second per hertz. So is that good? 75 bits per second per hertz? Well, let's see what MIMO capacity we would need uh, to handle 11AX at its most aggressive. 160 megahertz, eight stream, eight stream MCS 11, 802 11AX is, is 9.6 gigabits per second. So 9608 megabits per second in 160 megahertz is 60 bits per second per hertz. So yes, 75 bits per second per hertz of capacity in the test bed is very good. Uh, it handles 11AX even at its most, most aggressive. So having done all that, hopefully convinced you that, uh, that these uh, test bed antennas are certainly critical and also that um, the, the test beds themselves are more than capable of handling uh, you know, MIMO testing. Um, let's do some demos before we run out of time. Um, and um, uh, what I'm gonna do is uh, do a couple of demos that are related to all the things I just talked about. Um, the test bed that we're using is uh, the, a test bed we call the Stack Max. Uh, it's the test bed we've been using in all the other tutorials, and um, I'm not going to get into a huge amount of detail. Um, it has a number of chambers. They're all connected to each other in various ways. Actually, what I'd like to point out here in this picture this time are the antennas. So take a look uh, in this top uh, chamber here. You can see uh, antennas that are all around uh, the DUT, for example. Uh, you can see in the lower chambers, um, we've got cases where we've got multiple rows of antennas um, on one side, for example, uh, others where we have only a single row of antennas. So antenna placement in the test bed is extremely flexible um, and um, also very important. It's really important to understand kind of what's going on. Um, what I, uh, the other thing I'd just like to kind of highlight here, this is a logical then picture of that same stack, the one that I just showed you. Um, for, so for example, this one labeled smart box at the top, the big one with the access point on a turntable um, is the one that had the antennas located all around. Um, one thing um, just to, uh, so you understand what's going on is that when we draw the antennas, when we draw these dark blue antennas, we're actually talking about a set of four antennas. When we draw these green antennas, we're talking about a set of two. So here you can see it, it looks like only a few antennas, but if you look up here, you'll see um, many, many antennas in there. I'm gonna explain why we have uh, so many antennas and kind of why groups of four also. So let's do the first demo uh, where um, we just talk about um, the, the, the ability of a test bed like ours to get very high MIMO counts. Um, so I'm gonna run uh, traffic between an access point and a, uh, and a, uh, a test endpoint and uh, show you what that looks like. Let me uh, jump over to, so uh, this, is a, this is one of our test beds um, and um, one thing I just want to point out is that um, I've attached this test bed by browsing uh, directly into it uh, using the browser. This is uh, this test bed is just on our local network, um, and this is uh, one of the ways, one of the things that makes uh, using our test beds convenient. Um, you can actually um, reach them 
pretty much from anywhere, or actually from anywhere. In this particular case, I've browsed into um, to an IP address that's on our corporate network. It's actually also possible to go directly over the internet. We have some test beds that can be reached that way as well. Um, uh, just quick for people who haven't seen it before, this is our user interface. Uh, our user interface, by the way, is undergoing uh, some major changes. Um, we'll have all this functionality that I'm going to show now, but um, hopefully in, in a, even a, a more user-friendly and uh, uh, convenient uh, interface in, in upcoming tutorials, I suspect we'll start to switch over to that new, newer uh, interface. But uh, um, for today, i um, show you this one. Um, we have the ability in, uh, in the interface to configure the test completely. Um, I have set up uh, traffic um, here between uh, the, um, essentially between the device under test and um, the, um, the PAL, uh, which is the test endpoint. Uh, just sorry, real quickly, it looks like that has disassociated. I'm not sure why. So we can get it to come back. Um, I will check in a minute. Um, we can do uh, many other things. We can control our attenuators. We control our turntables, things like that. Um, there we go. OK. Um, so let me, let me uh, just run some traffic now and uh, show you a couple other things. So now I'm running traffic um, between my, uh, my device under test and my test um, antenna, uh, my test um, device. And the, the point we wanted to make here, right, is that we can do, uh, we can handle multiple um, MIMO spatial streams in the test bed. You can see that over here. You can see that we've got, um, uh, interesting. Uh, you can see that we've got four streams don't know why the test stopped. It was actually configured for much longer than this. Um, so you can see we've got four spatial streams. Uh, you can see that we're getting uh, MCS 11, the 2400 megabit per second uh, physical layer, uh, and you know oh, nearly one and a half gigabits per second of throughput. Um, the, uh, the signal levels, as I mentioned before, are quite high, which is what you know, justifies our ability to support uh, such high wideband capacity. Uh, you can see, you know, so 40, negative 40 dBm, um, meaning, you know, we have 60, 70 dB of, um, uh, of uh, signal noise ratio. Okay. Pop back over now to our presentation. Okay, uh, so um, one of the things that I wanted to um, describe here is why we have... Charlie, there is a question oh. we may want to take from Nihar. Sure. By the way, Nihar sent us a note. He's using our high-gain antennas. That's, that's terrific. They're actually quite popular in the industry now. Uh, so Nihar is asking, can we test the receive sensitivity uh, with the setup for any AP? Yeah, actually you can. Uh, receive sensitivity is actually one of the uh, tests defined by the Broadband Forum, TR398. Uh, we talked about that in the last tutorial, so if you'd like to take a look at that, um, feel free. Um, but yes, you can certainly do that. Um, you know, we, we have a number of different ways uh, that, we, that we test perceived sensitivity, but uh, the, the Broadband Forum test is, is one of them. Um, and that one is something that we have uh, implemented um, in, in automation um, and is available to anybody who wants. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about is kind of why we have these groups of four all the time. Um, and, you know, so we're just talking about four streams and uh, we were, you know, I, I, I mentioned that we always have, you know, we, we often have these groups of four paths of antennas. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the relationship between those two. Um, imagine we have a, a four-stream capable device under test and a four-stream capable receiver on the other end, um, and, um, and we want to see four streams, uh, four spatial streams. Um, well, so it turns out that um, what's important there is that um, there be at least four independent 
RF paths between the two. Um, it's kind of mathematically, you kind of get into the details on this one, but it's just another one of those things that's actually fairly straightforward to understand if you think about it. Um, in order to have four independent spatial streams, the transmitter and receiver have to be able to differentiate between those streams um, somehow. And um, that, you can imagine, is not possible to do if you don't have independent RF paths. So as I'm going to show you, if you actually do have four independent paths, you can get four streams. If you start to uh, choke them down, so if you, if you turn off one of the paths, for example, by increasing the attenuation um, and leave yourself with only three paths, you'll see the, the system drop to three streams. The AP and the, uh, and the station simply will not be able to support more streams than paths. It'll drop to two if we leave only two paths, and it'll drop to one if we leave only one path. So let me show you that. It's kind of interesting, and um, not everyone has seen this before. If you see here, we're starting with four paths, and now we're going to do exactly what I did in that slide. We're going to turn off one of them, and if you look, you can see the system immediately drop to three. Again, I haven't changed the AP or the station in any way. I'm just changing the number of available RF paths. And every time I drop a path, I drop a stream. You see me coming down to one here. Now, so as I said, you need the number of uh, paths at least um, to match the number of, of uh, streams that you want. Um, at, and I say at least, because you can always have more paths. So let's do the same test where I have only a two stream capable device. So if I have a two stream capable device uh, and I turn off one of the paths, leaving myself with only three paths, I will still get two streams. And if I turn off another one, I'll still have two streams. But if I turn off that last one, I'm only gonna have one stream. And I can show you that as well. So again, if you look here now, you can see up there, we've got two streams to start off with because we've got only a two stream capable device. And if I turn off one of my RF paths, see, I still got two streams, even though I've turned off an RF path. If I turn off another RF path, Still got two streams. I've got two paths. I can still get two streams. But if I take away that last path and I leave myself with only one, you can see that the, the, uh, the station and the AP are really only able to distinguish one spatial stream at that point. Um, and we drop to one. Um, other things uh, that are important about antennas, right, is the ability to, to do things like beamforming. Uh, so beamforming is especially important in Wi-Fi for looking at um, multi-user MIMO performance. And um, you know, again, one of the one of the questions that we often hear is, yeah, is it possible though to do beamforming in a small footprint test bed um, like you have there? Uh, and the answer to that question is yes. I'm going to show you how that works as well. In this particular case, we are using um, uh, this this uh, box on the right, it's called the PAL box, um, which has both our uh, Wi-Fi 6 PAL in it, but also a set of 16 uh, other independent uh, station PALs, known as stay PALs, um, with a variety of operating systems. Um, and we're going to do multi-user MIMO uh, to two of them. Um, the way we do this is uh, those uh, 16 uh, state pals are actually coming in on these sets of antennas that are located in the corners that I just circled here. Um, you see I've got a set of two antennas in all the corners, um, meaning that the, uh, the AP is actually able to, uh, to create beams. Um, Please, um, yeah. before, uh, sorry for uh, um, interrupting the, the flow, but the, we have a question uh, from Nihar. Um, uh -huh. He's asking to test eight by eight spatial streams, we need two attenuators. Is this correct? That is correct. And the current octoscope attenuator we have is, is 60 dB supported. To achieve 90 dB attenuation, is it possible that current one can be upgraded with software? 
Uh, not with software, but it can be upgraded. Uh, our attenuators, uh, our current um, generation of attenuators actually support 90 dB of attenuation. So it's probably a good conversation, you know, offline uh, to talk about, um, uh, you know, how to how to make sure that you've got the functionality that you need. Um, All right. Cool. Quickly, I'm going to quickly go through the uh, this this multi-user MIMO demo very quickly. Um, so what I'm showing here, I see you, Naveen, we'll, we'll, we'll address in a minute. Um, I'm showing here um, traffic going uh, from our AP to one of our state pals. You can see I've got MCS 11, 80 megahertz, so uh, 1.2 gigabit per second physical layer, over a gigabit per second of throughput. Uh, and I've got a separate state pal, uh, and I'm going to uh send traffic to that guy and you can see it's exactly the same this is my red guy my green guy here uh so again very similar i've got the same data rate I've got the same throughput but the interesting thing here is if i turn them both on and you look at the aggregate throughput so you know this is the the, the classic signature of multi-user MIMO in operation. You can see I've got only a 1,200 megabit per second physical layer rate, but I'm getting over 1,500 megabits per second of throughput. The only way that's possible is if I have independent physical layers, um, which is what multi-user MIMO is doing for me. Um, so you can see uh, multi-user MIMO here operating in the test bed um, for 11A acts. Um, let's see, um, I'm going to very quickly, I know we have a couple questions to get to, uh, and um, uh, the last thing I just want to show here, uh, we're, we're almost at the end and then I'm going to take all your questions. Um, the last thing I want to show here is I do want to discuss a little bit about polarization. Um, the, um, I mentioned before that these antennas are in fact polarized. Uh, and have a little description here of how easy it is to modify the antennas in the test bed. So, uh, so what, what's uh, interesting about this, right, is that um, given the ease with which you can, um, you know, change the antennas in the test bed, you can actually take a look at the effect polarization would have on results. So I ran a test here um, where, uh, and I'm going to show you the details of the configuration in just a minute, but as you can see, um, I've got my four streams. Uh, if you look up here, I've got four streams. I've got four um, RF pads. And, um, and what I'm doing in this test is one by one, I'm rotating the antennas as just shown to go from um, linearly polarized to cross polarized uh, or you know, polarized to cross polarized so that, uh, and, and it, you can watch each, as I turn down each one of those uh, antennas, um, the, the, uh, the, the received signal level drops. Um, and let's take a look at the details behind that drop. It's a little hard to see at this scale, but this is the test I did. So if you look at the device under test, you can see that the antennas, you know, are clear sort of dipole-like antennas. You can see their polarization. And if you look at our antennas, it's this set of four up here. So you can see I initially had them aligned with the device under test. And then what I was doing was individually turning each one so it would be cross-polarized like that. And if you look at that data, kind of zoom in on it, you can see the effect. It's actually a fairly significant effect. We're, took, we're looking at about 15 dB uh, from, um, from cross-polarizing the antennas. So you can see a fairly uh, noticeable drop in the received signal level. So just quickly, uh, let me quickly kind of summarize a little bit about antennas, uh, everything we've discussed today. 
So it's important to know that antennas, right, have frequencies of operation. There is a raised hand uh, if you'd like to take a question from the. I'm going to finish this slide and then I'm going to take all the questions because this is the last slide. Um, so um, the antennas, they have frequency of operation, they have gain, they have directionality. So it is important to choose the right antenna for your testing. Polarization does have an effect. Um, and so it's best practice to align the test antennas with the dud antennas whenever possible. You need at least as many RF paths as spatial streams to do this MIMO testing. You can have more, but you can't have fewer. Um, and if those paths are reasonably well separated and the chamber environment allows the separation of many spatial streams, um, you know, as we showed, you can actually you know, do uh, high order MIMO testing. And so most importantly, a well-designed small form factor RF chamber can be an excellent low cost environment for testing higher MIMO, beamforming, and other advanced wireless features. Um, so with that said, I know there were a bunch of questions, so let's take them all right now. Uh, do we have a- Good question? morning, Lee. Yeah, hi, good morning. Yeah, so uh, I do have one question. So there is a feature called antenna diversity. So for choosing the right antenna, uh, do, we, uh, do we have this feature tested? Antenna diversity? Yeah, I mean, antenna diversity uh, usually refers to uh, the fact that, uh, let's say on the AP side, the receiver itself uh, will be getting uh, signals on all of the antennas uh, and, and the, uh, the receiver can choose uh, how it wants to use those antennas, right? It might choose to, um, to be able to do high order MIMO Right, or it might choose uh, to um, to simply pick, you know, the 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 receiver with the with the best signal level, uh, and go with that. So, um, you know, I think the the point about antenna diversity is just that the uh, the antennas need to be uh, in sort of a different enough um, environment that the receiver can treat them separately. And we can see that it is able to do that by the fact that we do get high order MIMO. Um, so in fact, you know, it's able to actually differentiate multiple spatial streams, not only uh, use it for something like, you know, maximal ratio combining or, or straight, you know, antenna diversity. So Lee, um, a, a little bit on, along those notes, there is yeah. a question here from Nihar. Um, is asking about um, antenna polarization and whether it can be used as, a, as an independent uh, path. Um, uh, he's asking, is antenna polarization also important for OFDMA gain? And can, can you get um, OFDMA benefits by using uh, polarization? Well, that's interesting. Um, you know, so OFDMA doesn't strictly require uh, spatial separation in any way, right? OFDMA is doing separation in the frequency domain. Um, we have uh, heard uh, that you get better uh, OFDMA performance, for example, when, when the devices that are being used have similar received signal levels. And so uh, to that, you know, at that level, it might be um, important to think about making sure that your, your devices um, you know, have the kind of similar RF paths, but um, at least, you know, I haven't seen that. I have not seen that polarization makes a big difference in OFDMA. I will admit that I haven't tested that in, in great detail yet, but from a theoretical point of view, OFDMA is focused more on the frequency domain than on the spatial domain. If I may jump in, uh, also, uh, it, the question could mean another thing, like in a small device like a phone, Mm -hmm. your antennas are necessarily close. And so it's going to be hard to send two different streams because being close, they will hear the same thing. And if spatially they hear the same thing, yeah. uh, you cannot send two streams. Uh, mm -hmm. But what you can do is polarize them, cross-polarize them. Yeah. And in fact, it's a common trick in a small device, an IoT device or a phone, to cross-polarize so that you can get multiple streams. Regarding OFDMA, of course, you get multiple streams by virtue of phasing and frequency offsetting. 
uh, and so you don't need that diversity um, to put multiple devices on uh, the link. But for MIMO, for MIMO, what, yeah. for MIMO you do, and it's a common trick to use polarization to right. get more streams. Yep, exactly. That's true. Yeah, for MIMO, that's exactly true. Um, I know we've gone a little bit long. Um, I'm happy to stay and take questions, but um, that is the end of today's tutorial. Next week, we're going to talk about test methodologies. Real Well, not next week, next seminar, which should be in a week or two. Uh, real life versus controlled test bed. Um, but as always, if there are topics that are of particular interest to you, feel free to send them in and we will try and work them into the series. So thanks very much for attending. As I said, I will stick around. Um, for those of you who were not aware, um, all of those tutorials, including this one, are, um, are recorded and have been posted. So this is the set so far. We'll be adding this one. And um, you know, please, if any of them seem of interest, go back and take a look. Yep. Thank you, thank you folks for attending. Uh, we have another session at 4.30 Eastern and then a third one, 10.30 Eastern.